Okay, welcome everybody to the intro to Skyglass. This is going to be kind of a short version. The first few recordings of the Zooms were about two and a half hours. I'm going to try and keep it below two uh, if we can. Uh, that's probably going to be tough, but we'll, we'll, we're going to go over the, the features that are most often used within Skyglass from an introductory perspective. Um, always feel free to uh, ask questions. I would love if you, you know, the questions is really where we get, um, obviously you'll get the most bang for the buck from this class, but I also get a lot of, you know, guidance from how to improve the software and how to make it better and all that kind of thing from interacting with users and customers. So um, feel free to ask questions. The chat is a great place to drop questions if you want to just leave it there. Um, I'm notoriously poor at actually following the chat. So, uh, Ren, could I ask you again to to be the chat monitor? Will you be my hall monitor for today? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take that as a yes. I don't see your your camera anymore, but that's all right. Uh, so you're welcome to drop um, uh, questions in the chat, uh, and someone will remind me. Uh, you're also welcome to just unmute yourself and remind or you know interrupt me and and just ask your question um, anytime throughout today. And uh, I would be um, most grateful if you could uh, put your video on just so that I can kind of get a visual cue, uh, you know, if, if things are tracking or you can raise your hand and I can get that kind of response. Um, that's really helpful for me. You can also use the uh, um, gestures, the little, uh, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, raise your hand kind of thing. Um, that's not as useful but it still gives me an indication of, you know, um, what's happening for you. So uh, anyway, so let's cover the um, topics for today. Actually, before I do that, quick show of hands, um, how long you've been using Skyglass. So if you're within, like, this is your first week, give me a, an indication. Brand new people, never use it. Oh, awesome. Okay. And who's the, that's, uh, that's okay job. Excellent. All right. So we got a couple of Brand new users and folks that have been sort of in the last couple of months. A little bit of it, okay. A little bit. Uh, well, I, I just, um, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not very good with the em emojis. Um, not here. I, I can't find anything. I haven't used Zoom in a long time. Um, yeah, I, I actually only joined a week ago. So, yeah. Awesome. New. So you're a new user too. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And then of course, I know we've got some old timers here. Anybody more than six months? Ren, are you going to raise your hand? Thomas, good. excellent. Okay, good, good, good stuff. Uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh, that's great. Beta and iOS. Okay, good. That's a good reminder. I'll cover a little bit of um, the iOS and mobile uh, stuff uh, when we get into that too. Okay, good. Let me make a note of that. iOS. Excellent. Okay, so let's cover the topics for today. Again, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter form. I'm not going to go over um, the onboarding process. Uh, we're not going to do watch list in detail. We're not going to do the advanced functions of time travel, flight history, or the database. And we're not going to talk about the preferences panel. Uh, everything except for the preferences panel has already been covered in a deep dive. Um, another Zoom uh, live training session, and all those are up on YouTube on, and also in the tutorial section on my website. So feel free to check those out. Uh, what we will be covering today is uh, basics of the user interface all over the place, uh, every piece of it. Um, how to obviously rotate the camera, move the camera around, how to move the map. Uh, we're going to talk about how to load traffic in mill mode and in standard mode talk about how to switch those modes and do that most responsibly. And the limitations are in, uh, in standard mode. That's a really important part. Um, how to change your home location, which applies in standard mode. Uh, we will talk about traces. We will talk about the type list panel and the watch list panel in a quick overview, just kind of get you started. Um, but again, if you really want to get the most out of the watch list panel, definitely do the deep dive because there is a ton of stuff with that really built that one out um, a lot. And last, uh, how to tune your interface for best results, uh, sort of some cul-de-sacs you don't want to get yourself into, how to get yourself out when you things are bad or, you know, got something stuck. Um, so before I move any further along, let me close the uh, agenda and let's do a mouse and a mic check. First mic check, everybody can hear me okay. No problem with that. Good, good. 
All right, and the mouse, can you see my pointer? Okay, on the screen, moving around. All right, I'm getting some nods. Okay, good, so we no problem there, it's not too small. All right, perfect. Okay, so uh, let me clean up my interface. And um, so the first thing after, so again, I'm not gonna cover the onboarding process. You should have already downloaded, installed the software, created a username, got that activated, and now you're online with SkyGlass. Um, if you have any trouble with those things, feel free to reach out to me using the need help button on the website. It's on the bottom right-hand corner of every web page, or you can use the support form uh, from the drop-down menu and just reach out to me directly. And I'm online most days and will respond hopefully uh, within a few minutes, if not a few hours. All right. So uh, first thing, when you first launch SkyGlass, the first thing you want to do is uh, get the user interface to a point where you can see it easily. There's such, so many um, different variations of, of screens and sizes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the main button stack is what we call this. Uh, at the top of that stack, there are two little chevrons up and down. And you'll when you hover over that, it turns green. Click on that and drag upwards. And you'll see that that uh, not only scales the, the uh, main button stack, but it also will scale all the different parts of the user interface in all four corners. Okay, so I'm going to make this sort of absurdly large for today, just so everybody can see it. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but you can, you know, obviously tune that as you like. <clears throat> Hold on one moment. Other thing I really like about you guys asking questions is I can take a little break and uh, wet my throat. All right, so um, the bottom right-hand corner, the main button stack is this first big column. Uh, you'll notice that you can um, collapse the auxiliary stuff, the stuff that builds out to the left of that uh, with this button on the very bottom. Uh, clicking on that sort of hides the user interface. It's nice if you want to take a screenshot or keep it sort of minimized and uh, you know tight UI in that perspective, but all the, the extended functionality is on the auxiliary button stack which is here. And then depending on your settings, you'll get other things that will populate out to the left. Uh, so by default, um, when you first start SkyGlass, you're gonna be in military mode, which is in the main button stack, this shield icon <clears throat> is green. And that means you're in mill mode. And then when you're in mill mode, it's gonna default automatically to auto refresh. So it's automatically going to periodically update all the aircraft positions. Um, and when that is on, so let me toggle it off and then toggle it back on, you'll see we've got a little blue uh, auxiliary pop-out panel, which has a slider on it that gives you uh, the refresh, you know, periodicity, how often it's going to auto-refresh. Uh, so first note on how to keep SkyGlass sort of tuned effectively, um, depending on what you're doing, uh, and what you have loaded, uh, you may want to adjust that that auto refresh to what your computer can keep up with, essentially, uh, and what you know makes sense for you. Um, you know, if you're under kind of a long, a, a wide view, anything you know, thirty seconds to a minute is pro is practical in that sense. Uh, but if you're like looking at an airport, you'll probably want to tune that up um, to be uh, you know faster, even up to one second. Um, but if you have other, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, if you have traces on or other things that can, can really hog memory and hog processing and take up to, you know, while the process, you don't want to get SkyGlass into a situation where it takes longer to do its job of loading and rendering than your auto refresh has given it right in, in the in-betweens. So you'll just, if one thing, you know, if, if SkyGlass seems to be a little, uh, wonky or things don't seem to like be keeping up, just extend that auto refresh out a little bit longer so that there's a little bit of a, a break um, and SkyGlass can do all it's all that it needs to do based on what you've uh, you know told it to do. Okay, did that make sense? Auto refresh. Okay, great. So uh, sort of moving further down, uh, we'll talk more about traces in a little bit. The camera icon just takes a screen grab. Uh, first time you take a screen grab, it will ask you for a place to save your screen grabs, and then it will remember that setting, and then it'll just put them all there, when, uh, any subsequent screen grab. Uh, the preference panel is activated with this big gear icon um, in the main button stack, and the uh, pop-up help for all the new users, this is um, also on by default, and a really 
you know, I think a good function. Uh, basically, anytime you hover over anything that's got a button or, uh, you know, has some instruction, there'll be a little pop up on top of the auxiliary button stack and the main button stack in this uh, instance is stop all loading actions. So it just gives you a very brief explanation of what that button does. So you can kind of learn all the functionality in a, you know, in a brief way. Um, so you, I, if you, you probably want to keep that on, I'm going to turn that off for the class just so it doesn't distract me and be, uh, uh, you know, take up the screen space. Okay. And so um, let me cover one piece of the, uh, Preferences panel, which is important. Uh, so I'm going to open that up now. And um, that is on the left-hand side in the center. You, we've got the save preference options. So if you get Skyglass kind of in a hole and it just you just want to kind of reset it and kind of get you back to where you were at the very beginning, um, that is this full reset button. And basically what this does is it trashes all the preferences, all the saved settings, and just rebuilds that file into the you know pristine state. So basically, just like you reinstalled Skyglass, um, if you delete and reinstall, uh, that actually doesn't affect the preferences. They'll just they're going to be remembered. So if you want to just kind of do a clean sweep of you know the interface and reset everything, that's what you do. Click click this big um, full reset button or the big flame, and that will log you out of Skyglass and and rebuild the preferences file back to your uh, original state. All right. So uh, moving forward. So um, let's talk about camera basics. <clears throat> the um, first thing we want to talk about is just clicking and dragging on the interface. That's going to move or translate the camera. Um, I kind of think about this in a you know in a little bit of a filming perspective in that you have a camera uh, that's viewing you know the scene here that we've got all of our traffic and the camera has a fixed point in the center which it rotates around okay so if you right click and drag you'll notice that the camera does a rotation um, you'll also notice if I uh, let me get my uh, camera down on the on the surface. There we go. And let me zoom in. So um, so I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So uh, left click translates the camera, right click does a rotate. The scroll wheel on your mouse will um, move the camera in and out from that center point of rotation, okay, which is marked on your screen uh, with a little purple target. Okay, and that's always going to be in the center of the screen, but it's going to get smaller as you zoom out. OK, um, the important thing to note here, though, is that, again, this is the center of rotation. So as you uh, translate that, uh, your camera, that center of rotation moves, um, but you're always going to rotate about that center. If you move in, you'll notice that that rotation becomes much tighter, right? But if you zoom out, then you kind of can, you know, uh, move around the, the scene. Um, you know, with a larger sort of a pan. It's kind of like a big dolly rig, uh, if you're familiar with camera rigs. Uh, anyway, so um, the if you have a non-mouse setup, uh, something like uh, like a trackpad on your iP uh, on your Apple, you know, Mac Pro or something like that, or MacBook Pro, um, there are keyboard shortcuts um, for the right click. So if you control and left click, which would be, you know, the click and drag on your tab on your on your trackpad. Uh, the control will do the mimic the um, right click rotation, and then option. If you hold down the option key and drag up and down, that's going to change the elevation of your point of rotation of your camera or your camera home position. All right. You also can use the keyboard. Uh, the arrow keys, uh, up, down, left, right, will do rotation, and then for all of us old. Uh, Doom gamers or keyboard warriors, the W, A, S, and D key are the translate um, on your keyboard. So if you hold down the W, that'll move you forward. S moves you backwards. Uh, A and D move your left and right. And then the Q and the E, which sort of flank that W, that will move you up and down, elevate your and uh, bring your camera down. Okay. So there are keyboard shortcuts depending on what you're doing. And if you get really fancy with it, you can do some keyboard combinations and get some cool camera moves. Mike, you may be interested in that. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, kind of fun for screen recording if you're doing a screen recording. Okay, 
Uh, any questions before I move on from the camera movements? Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away if anything. Nope. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right. I'm using a laptop, so I, I, I use the trackpad. Um, I think I, I do have a little, yeah, I, I use the arrow keys as well. Okay. So yeah, you're going to want to use that control key. That's going to be your rotation. Um, that's your master rotation for you. Um, also, uh, while we're here, let me talk about the iOS. So um, everything except for rotation is it's kind of the what you would expect for a, a touch interface. Uh, one tap drag will translate the camera around. Uh, two two finger you know movements, a pinch and zoom is going to do be your scroll. If you do three fingers uh, tap and up and down, that's going to do the elevation. The sort of hidden feature, the rotation, if you, uh, it's sort of two steps. You have to collapse the user interface using that minimize button on the bottom of the main button stack, and then do a single finger tap anywhere in this sort of bottom right hand quadrant. And that's going to uh, activate an on screen joystick and kind of give you a little joystick movement of rotation. So that's how you do rotation on mobile devices, iPad, Android phones, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, perfect. You're totally uh, blurred out, Ren, but thank you. <laughs> it's the background is doing a blend, but thank you. That's that's good. Uh, there is a, a video on YouTube that I talk about this specifically. Um, it's, you know, changes in the user interface. Uh, so anyway, you can reference that. Uh, but again, minimize the uh, user interface and then taps anywhere in this bottom right hand quadrant. And that's going to be an on-screen pop-up of your joystick. And then once you un, you know release the tap, it'll go away. All right. So uh, let me go through the interface, um, kind of go around the circle here. Um, the So the main interface buttons and, and all that kind of stuff is in the bottom right-hand corner. Bottom left-hand corner, uh, if you click on the sky glass um, word itself, that will activate this little yellow um, it's sort of a, it started out as a debug window when I was coding, and then I left it for the beta users and everybody kind of liked it. So I kind of just left it in there as an Easter egg for people. Um, basically, anytime that you're doing anything within Skyglass, it's going to tell you sort of the last thing that happened and kind of give you a, uh, an indicator of what's happening in that moment. Um, it'll move quickly, you know, through things, but uh, it may be useful for you, kind of could be interesting, also gives you some data counts on how things, you know, took to load, how long it took, and things like that. Um, so, and if you don't want that, you can just click on the Skyglass um, word itself, and that'll hide that. Um, you'll also notice this little special beta testing um, window that popped up. That's just an internal thing that you're not going to see that on yours, uh, but I can't disable it on mine. It's tied to your, your, um, your login or your username. So anyway, I'll turn that off for now. Um, these are also some badges, a system that will be rolling out in more detail later. If you're a feeder, if you're part of the Monkey Nation, if you're a, a subscriber, um, if you're a bug tester, uh, Skyrider, any of those kind of group ones, um, those will be uh, part of more future releases, but that's what those little icons are for. We've got some other attribution here for ADSB Exchange and for Mapbox, the map system. Uh, the top left-hand corner will give you uh, the current time in UTC, universal time code, sort of Greenwich mean time. Um, we'll also give you the uh, your current home location if you have chosen a home location. Um, and then a quick, you know, sort of very, very basic weather, uh, current weather um, at that home location. All right. So, uh, and that will update, you know, every minute the weather will. And then if you change your home location, that will also update and give you a different uh, readout of your uh, the, the location that you have picked here. Um, I just happen to have double clicked on the uh, somewhere out in Texas, and that's why that jewel state is there, our jewel court. Uh, okay, top right hand corner. Uh, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Actually, I'm just going to drag this down because often my keyboard or my camera will show over this part. Um, this line at the top shows the sort of the counts of the. Um, what you have loaded on the screen at the moment. We're in military mode. Um, and so the showing is the uh, actually how many aircraft have been rendered. Um, 
the last load is how many aircraft were actually in the return that I asked from ADSB Exchange. And then we've got a breakout of uh, mill and masked. Um, this negative in the three, uh, this, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but th that shows how many were scrubbed in the last um, cycle, meaning they weren't updated in the last few auto refresh cycles. They're determined as kind of a stale uh, return. But they're going to be wiped off screen. And then this on screen piece, that's um, probably what most of you are interested in. Uh, if I zoom in to a certain area, it's going to update very quickly of just how many aircraft are on screen, um, not versus how many are loaded or versus, you know, how many are actually rendered in the scene. Uh, when you're in mill mode, um, all the all the traffic worldwide are returned, and so you're going to see um, you know everything everything is going to be rendered on on the map depending on the um, zoom setting etc. Um, but if you want to sort of get a you know count of you know hey what's over you know with continental United States just move your camera to so you're only seeing that and then you'll get an on screen count which is accurate. Uh, Monkey likes to do this when he's uh, you know doing his sit reps. He'll pull out certain things um, and then do an on-screen count. Okay, and so uh, Kitty, to your um, point here, this bot, uh, top right-hand corner uh, icon, that will activate or deactivate the heads-up display, which is if you then hover over any aircraft, you'll get um, the aircraft detail over the icon itself, and then you'll also get this representation on the type right, top right-hand corner. So let me go into that with a little bit more detail. Um, so let me let me set the screen up here. Let me get an aircraft up and easy to see. There we go. All right. So as far as the and let me turn off auto refresh so we can keep it nice and still. Okay. So as far as the uh, aircraft icon and what all that means. Um, there's a, several different aspects. First, the bottom most piece of this sort of uh, um, representation of the aircraft is a little, little chevron. And that chevron is going to be pointed in the area or in the, you know, in the direction that the aircraft is flying. And that is actually the uh, point in space in this simulation of where that, uh, that aircraft is in space. Um, that will always be on screen, the aircraft position in a little chevron. The chevron will be one of three colors. It will be either green, red, or blue. Green means it's climbing. Red means it's descending. And blue, the sort of um, cyan, uh, you know, pale blue, that means that it is a level flight. It has not changed. Um, uh, it's not going up or down more than 50 feet uh, per minute. Okay. So the first element, again, is this air, uh, the chevron. Again, that is the actual aircraft position in space. Um, this uh, octagon with the aircraft profile, you can think of as a compass rose, all right? It is, it's going to position the um, icon profile of the aircraft based on its heading as if this were, a you know, the cardinal direction. So this one obviously is heading sort of uh, easterly and... Um, if we now talk about the pop-up area here, um, the aircraft type um, that's being reported from the transponder. Again, all this is based off of the transponder in an aircraft uh, sending out a signal which gives its position and you know the telemetry and other aircraft information, the type, the call sign, um, its hex code, obviously the unique identifier for the um, transponder and all that stuff. So this is, if you, you know, if you, if you're a fan of monkey and you're watching, there'll be a, a lot of aircraft that don't have for one reason or another, whether it's uh, intentional or just because there's an issue with a transponder or whatever, there'll be a lot of transponders that don't show a type code, like what type of aircraft that is. So you'll get a little NA here. Sometimes you won't get a call sign either. Um, so sometimes these will be, uh, you know, not reported, but again, that's, you know, the aircraft transponder is driving the entire system, picked up by the feeders, then fed back into the ADSB exchange system, and then I get that return and, and render it in SkyGlass. So aircraft type is the top left, the call sign, in this case, Grizzly 39 in the top right. Uh, below the call sign will be the aircraft registration often referred to as the tail number. It's what's painted on the aircraft in black letters. Um, 
that for military, it's going to be just kind of a bunch of numbers. Uh, for uh, commercial aircraft or private aircraft, it starts with an N in North America. That's what they, they call it an N, an N number. Sometimes people think of it as the end number, but it's actually N like Nancy. Uh, anyway, and then the, um, the hex code is um, decoded for the country. Okay, the hex code is the one in magenta on the right uh, and sort of in the middle. Again, the hex code is referred to, uh, you'll hear that a lot uh, when, when you talk about feeders or in, in flight tracking. That is the unique identifier for the transponder itself. Okay, it's one of the few things that won't ever change from flight to flight to flight. Okay, the uh, call sign, especially for military, changes every flight, can change mid-flight, uh, depending on if their, you know, their mission profile changes, they will, they'll change a call sign. Um, the uh, registration is, um, that's also kind of a lookup. It's, it's, it's given to me by ADSB Exchange, but that's not actually uh, um, sent out with the transponder feed from what I remember. Uh, so that's sort of a lookup. Anyway, and then this country code is just a decode of the hex code uh, to give you an indication of where, you know, what, what country that hex code and tail number is registered in. Okay. Uh, and then this bottom row, oh, so um, on the, in this midsection here, the left-hand side in green, 7612, that is what is uh, the current squat code. Um, a, the air traffic control assigns every aircraft that's under air, traf air traffic control uh, a unique, it's actually not unique, um, it's unique in that sort of area of space. Uh, they don't, you won't have a hex code in the same area, like over the same state or something that are the same, I'm sorry, same transponder code, but you may see the same transponder code, you know, across the planet in different, uh, different times. So anyway, this is uh, assigned by ETC, air traffic control, given to the aircraft. That's what they actually dial in on their squat code that uh, tunes their transponder to put out this number so it's easier for them to track. Um, I mentioned this because um, if an aircraft declares an emergency, then there are specific hex codes, I'm sorry, um, squat codes that they will change then to show that they are in an emergency state. And those are the 7700s. Uh, 7700 is general emergency, 7600 I think is um, the uh, no radio, Nordo, and then 7500 is hijacked aircraft. Uh, those are the three that are, are um, um, sort of uh, the standard. Um, they also, the air traffic control may also just flag it as an emergency. And that's, there's a, um, a flag that I get in the data that's returned. And that's how we, you know, we'll show the emergency aircraft um, if you have that setting on, which I'll talk about later. Okay, and then the bottom part here is the telemetry of the aircraft. What the uh, current altitude is, the change in altitude, um, in, you know, uh, per minute. Uh, this is this one, 128 feet going up in a positive. If it's negative, it'll be a, um, if it's descending, it'll be a negative number. Uh, the speed in knots, <clears throat> in this case, 447.7 knots. And then the last is the current heading. <coughs> Excuse me. So all this data is basically mirrored in the top right-hand corner if you have the um, HUD activated. <clears throat> And again, to turn that HUD on and off, you can just click on this uh, top furthermost uh, right-hand corner icon and then hover over an aircraft again. Um, there's a little bit more information uh, off to the left. Uh, let's see if we can find one um, that actually has, there's one, there we go. So this uh, E3, um, you can see there is, oh, let me hover over it again, there we go. Uh, you can see there's a, a little thumbnail with its picture. This is an actual picture of the aircraft that someone took and then uploaded to the plane spotter um, database. And then we can integrate that into, or, you know, download it and bring it into Skyglass. If you click on the image itself, you'll get a little bit larger um, picture of it, more detail. And then if you click on the uh, little information uh, icon in the bottom right hand corner of that, that'll pop you out to the uh, plane spotter web page, and you can you know look at more detail and look at other pictures of that aircraft. Basically, this is showing the last photograph that was taken of this aircraft. Uh, it's kind of cool. Not air, not all aircraft will have plane spotter images, but um, often you do. But just to remember that this is not like a representation of that type of aircraft. That's the actual aircraft. Uh, somebody that took a picture of it on the on the ramp somewhere or in flight and then uploaded it to their system. 
All right. <clears throat> and then to the left, we just got a larger representation of the aircraft profile. And then we've got some extra uh, buttons here. Um, I'm not going to talk about the hourglass. That is the uh, flight history reporting that you can get for just this aircraft. Um, this uh, top left-hand corner, the, the banner is the watch list representation. It's a button. If you click on it, it will add this aircraft to your watch list and then show in green. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. And then these other three, um, the target, the uh, transmission tower, and the database, those will activate these added panels below the, the HUD, which you see here. Uh, so let me turn them off so they'll all go away. The um, target icon does two things. It shows you, it does a quick lookup, um, which to be honest is not super accurate. Um, the type, it does a lookup of the type that's reported and tries to identify what the actual like manufacturer model number of that is. Um, but again, there's so many variations of different types that that one's not as accurate as I'd like to be. Uh, but it does give you the manufacturer as well. So in this case, it's such a, a Cessna Citation Jet uh, Encore. And then in this next panel, it shows the actual latitude and longitude that was reported. So the lat long, and then does a lookup of that uh, and gives a vector and direction um, to the nearest <clears throat> metropolitan area. So kind of the closest city. And then it shows, in this case, you know, 29... <clears throat> 29 miles south of uh, Kalispell, Montana, and then the local time of that aircraft of that position. Um, so useful if you took a screenshot, you know, then you'd have the actual detail of that aircraft position. Um, if you click on the tower, let me move this back up. <clears throat> if you click on the tower, uh, then you get this extra panel here, sort of that was sandwiched in the middle. And uh, when you're in military mode, you're not going to get much detail here. For some reason, that isn't uh, shared. Um, when you're in standard mode, you may get more information. Uh, what type of, tr uh, what mode the transponder is in, whether it's an ADS-B mode or mode S. Um, you'll also get some, you know, category information, sort of a higher level view, be it a single engine land or multi-engine land, rotorcraft, uh, balloon, uh, you know, lighter than aircraft, something like that. That's the, the ICAO, CAT, their category. Um, <clears throat> you may also get information about like the aircraft itself. Again, this is just, if it's, if it's put out by the transponder, then I've created a place where you can see that. So the nav mode could be if it has, um, uh, what's the thing I'm thinking of? Uh, TCAS, uh, you know, uh, collision avoidance, if it's an autopilot mode, things like that that may be represented this nav mode. Um, the rad C, <clears throat> that is an important one to track if you're you know, into the detail here. The, ra the rad C means radius of containment, and that is a, a number in meters showing the position confidence of that transponder signal. And that uh, usually it's within like 15 to 75 meters, um, <clears throat> you know, a couple hundred feet. Um, uh, but you're not going to, it's, you know, because of the velocity and the, the change of variation and the different, you know, transponders and all that, or the different feeders that it's picked up from, um, <clears throat> that'll get, give you a, a rough indication of its, uh, you know, position confidence. If it's in mode S, that, that becomes a very large number. And it could be, you know, several miles variation of where that position, you know, aircraft actually is versus what it's re being reported as in the system. Okay, so that's the Red Sea. Uh, and then if you have the database uh, activated, then you'll get a lookup of the owner operator the, um, and the other detail that's in the, um, the database. We're not going to cover that today. All right, so let me turn those off. And uh, just to cover, uh, finish up here, this bottom one, uh, this little horseshoe magnet, that will turn on um, flight follow me mode, which basically keeps that aircraft um, in center of the screen, the, the, the camera will zoom back to it if you move off of that um, uh, aircraft. And every time you refresh, it's gonna rehome the camera. So it kind of keeps that, that uh, aircraft in view all the time. That's in follow me mode. All right, uh, let me pause here for questions. If anybody has any. <clears throat> I did. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, I wanted to find out, you know how um, Monkey works, he has 
you see all the lines um, when you're following, when you click on one plane, it'll show the path that it's been on. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, how can you follow several at the same time? Okay, so we'll get into that when we talk about traces, probably the next segment, um, but I'll cover that for sure. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to do traces. Um, so I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, let me make a note here, traces. Okay, forking mouse. Okay, good. All right. So uh, let me talk about a few more pieces of the interface before we get into traces, because traces will be a, a long <laughs> conversation. Um, so in the auxiliary button stack, which is this uh, this main pop out next to the main button stack, uh, let me cover it from bottom to top. Uh, so the bottom most section, this little pop out here, is the map zoom, um, and basically it's going to zoom the map. The, the ground map up to different levels. It's almost at its most wide view uh, right now. That's kind of where I keep it at. If you go um, uh, about into more of a um, city or region sort of a space, and I oh, out over nowhere. So let me um, get a good home. Let me just pop that onto Tucson. Let that marinate. Okay, and I'm also going to do this uh, sort of out of order. If you click on the folded map icon, that will bring up a little sub panel, which gives you options for different uh, map styles. So I'm going to just get this back into satellite mode, which is the default style. Most of you are probably seeing it in. Uh, and Playing from B-Link 02. Oops. Sorry about that. Move that guy. Okay. So um, satellite view, as I said, about mid zone of the map zoom slider will give you kind of a city uh, or, you know, eh, regional sort of a look. Um, if you go all, all the way in, then you can get to a city block. Um, the, the zoom is actually pretty tight on this. You can go very, very far in. Uh, you'll notice also that I... I was clicking in the slider. I didn't click and drag the slider. Um, that's a probably a much easier way for you to use the slider. Um, it's you know it's nice to have a a, a quick you know have a have a spectrum to just click on. But if you try and drag the slider, you're going to have a poor user experience. These map tiles in this map system, uh, which is a plugin uh, for Mapbox, is not really good with this sort of um, you know uh, dynamic. Uh, viewing. So I like to sort of just, you know, click uh, somewhere where I kind of know where, you know, in a basic level. And then you can also use the plus and minus to just kind of bump that up the map zoom up or down a level. So let me just bump up again. And you can see, I mean, even on my, you know, pretty fast machine, I've got a good uh, internet connection. It takes a while for all these map tiles to, to load up. But as I said, full uh, full deflection to the right will give you basically a city block. And then if you click uh, way out here, um, you can get more of a, you know, continental uh, sort of a view there. So the thing to remember is, um, so let me dial in, uh, let me put in like Boca Raton, uh, my neck of the woods, and I'll zoom the map in. Um, as you change the map zoom level, you may want to then adjust two things. Uh, first is this um, in the in the group of vertical sliders. This one on the left. The um, I'm sorry. This one on the right. Uh, this is the what is called the height adjustment slider. This changes the relative height of all the aircraft um, that have been rendered on screen. So it kind of stretches and squishes all the different aircraft position to kind of give you that, that uh, height variation. Point is, if you as you zoom the map in, you'll want to keep bringing that down so that you're not losing aircraft off the top of your screen, okay? Um, if you take that slider and bring it all the way down, that is actual altitude with no you know, stretching or squishing, okay? It's actual altitude. Uh, the other thing you'll want to change is this um, second slider, which is basically, it's not changing the position of any aircraft. It's just giving the, it's uh, making the um, aircraft group. 
it's um, the Chevron and the icon and all the pop-ups, it's scaling all of those. Okay, so you just want to tune that to your you know monitor and how good your eyesight is and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, you will notice though. Uh, let me zoom back out with the map zoom, and um, and you'll notice my height adjustment slider is all the way down, so all the aircraft are at their actual position. And you know, hey, might as well have a flat map, right? Really hard to see the different flight levels, even though some are going to be on the ground and some are going to be at 50,000 feet. So that's why I created this height adjustment slider. Um, if you bring this all the way up, then you can very quickly and easily show, you know, the different uh, various flight levels if you kick your camera off to the side and you've got a nice little 3D view. Okay, so I know I bounced around a little bit there, covered a lot, really important stuff. Um, key takeaways are when you change your map zoom level, you'll want to then adjust the size of the aircraft for your viewing pleasure and also the height adjustment slider so that you basically can see everything that you want to see and you're not losing the top end stuff. All right. And then if you're if you're at an air sort of airport view, you know, at the at the top end of this map zoom, you'll just want to keep that low because then the actual aircraft makes more sense. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, is that the same for a helicopter? Same, same for all aircraft. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> there is no distinction of type of aircraft or any kind of filtering when you're doing that height adjustment slider. It scales everything. The only um, thing I was thinking is... about the other information? Uh, other information, the call signs and all that? Uh, basically, this is every any aircraft that has a transponder that's reporting. I'm basically giving giving to you what was given to me in that sense of what's in the system. So okay. that's um, depending on you know. So it's really again, it's 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 um, transponder driven. Um, it's not you know. There's very few lookups or things like you know um, matching that I'm doing apart from um, you know very basic uh, lookups of the you know the aircraft profile and stuff like that. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. You bet. All right. So again, um, height adjustment slider, really fun and cool way to just quickly see the different uh, flight levels uh, and all that the aircraft. Uh, one feature I am working on, love to get your guys' opinion about this. Um, I've asked, I've had several people say, hey, I'd love to be able to filter by altitude. Like put in, I only, only show me 50,000 feet and above or you know below 10,000, something like that. That useful? Thumbs up, thumbs down, maybe not not so interested. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. General consensus is that it would be kind of a cool feature. Um, it's always a balance of trying to keep it, you know, simple um, in a kind of a very complex world. And I and I will say that, you know, Skyglass has gotten pretty complicated. There's definitely a learning curve. Um, so uh, okay, so in the um Auxiliary button stack here, as we were working up the lo different levels, um, we talked about this middle icon in this next group up, uh, which is the map uh, style uh, pop out. So I'm going to turn that off. Um, this next one governs the sliders themselves. If you want to, you know, uh, turn them off. I like to keep them on screen because I use them so often. Um, there are a couple of other hidden ones uh, that are not as often uh, not used as often. If you click on this little button at the top, you'll see two more that pop out. Uh, this first one is a an adjustment for your mouse sensitivity. Um, again, there's a quite a variation of different mouse styles, and you know you can change the speed of your mouse on your computer itself. But this will actually you can you know tune that as well, make it um, you know slower or uh, much more responsive. I kind of like to keep mine down on the lower section, uh, but that's the first one is the mouse sensitivity. And then the second one, probably you're not going to use very often, uh, but everything in Skyglass and, you know, transponders most often report their altitude in barometric pressure. Um, all pilots, you know, that that's kind of what they need to think about in, uh, in Barrow. Um, it's not, you know, it's very different from the uh, actual altitude above ground. Uh, if you don't know much about barometric pressure altitude, uh, you can have a barometric pressure altitude, which is actually below the surface of the of the of the field. Let's say um, it changes based on the you know density and the temperature of the air. Uh, pilots will give you a long, nice explanation about that. Uh, but Barrow is basically what all transponders report in. Um, 
when you're in uh, flying under aircraft um, air traffic control and you're above 18,000 feet, uh, it might be an interesting data point. All transponders then are changed to sort of basic and so that they're um, they're sort of easier to manage. They're all flying at the same flight levels. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, so barometric pressure is what the system is reporting at. Um, you will notice at times though, because of this sort of weird, you know, anomaly of, of actual altitude above ground and what's being reported by the um, aircraft, sometimes if you're zoomed in on an airport, let's say like in Denver, something very high, uh, the aircraft may be going under the ground. So I created this little barometric um, adjuster so that you can basically kind of nudge everybody up or down and to kind of um, adjust for barometric pressure variations to kind of keep things looking at a more normal you know, position so things are actually landing on the aircraft, you know, tarmac, not below the surface. If you see the trace is actually going below, that means that the barometric pressure being reported is below surface. And so that's why you're getting that, that anomaly. Anyway, um, so I'd stay away from this unless you, you know, are zoomed in on an airport, uh, you know, pretty tightly and need to do this. And if you want to reset it, this is a little button at the bottom, click on it again, it'll reset it to zero. All right, but most often you'll wanna keep this collapsed because uh, these are the two that you're gonna use most often, the uh, scalar and the height adjustment slider. Okay, and again, these are in the uh, vertical button or vertical slider uh, icon here. Um, any questions before I move on? Oh, you might mention that the uh, mouse sensitivity also impacts the uh, keyboard controls. Ah, good point. Yes, it's sort of a global um, camera sensitivity adjustment. Yeah, yeah. All right, good, good point. Excellent. Okay, so um, in this, the last button in this uh, grouping here is this uh, location target. Uh, if I turn that off and turn it back on again, you'll see we've got this little pop up panel, pop out panel here. This is the location input uh, to change your home location. When you're in military mode, um, as I said before, all the aircraft are loaded globally, okay? So there's really not a use for the home location um, because you're getting all the aircraft, in, in, you know, across the planet. And regardless of where your map is, even if you, you know, bounce over, um, actually, let me get my mouse up a little bit more. Um, if you bounce over here to the, you know, Europe, um, doesn't matter. Home location has no impact on, the uh, rendering of the aircraft. When you're in standard mode, that's a completely different animal. So let me get back over to, um, oh, so let me put it this way. The home location can be useful when you're in mill mode uh, for just moving the camera to a specific location. If you have like an airport that you wanna look at, you can do that directly, um, open up the location uh, input panel, type in whatever you want. Uh, you can put in a city name, a state name, country name, uh, airport code. Um, if you're using an airport code, uh, sometimes it will take the three letter identifier. Often you'll need to put that for, um, air, uh, for, for fields in the United States, there's a K identifier that you wanna put in ahead of that. Um, so it all depends on the, uh, the um, uh, this is a sort of a geocoding reverse lookup by Google. Uh, it's sort of a natural language. Sometimes it's going to, you know, understand what an, uh, air, an airport code is. Sometimes it won't. Anyway, if you put in the airport code, it doesn't pop. Just add a K in front of it if it's in, over the United States uh, or North America, and it will probably get you there. Uh, you can even put in a zip code. Um, you can put in a street address. Uh, this is, as I said, natural language sort of interpreter, does a reverse geocode lookup, and then pops you to that location. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's useful to move your camera around when you're in mill mode, but it won't have really any other effect. Um, you will notice that there is also this other slider, which shows this sort of search distance radius. Uh, that is only going to impact what's happening if you are in standard mode. So um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's do that now. I'm going to switch uh, from mill mode into standard mode by clicking on the shield icon. And you'll notice a few things happen. First, it's going to clear all the returns. 
And um, if you had this um, location picker uh, disabled, it's gonna bring that up. And then you've got this little uh, search radius box that's painted on the screen. So the point here now is um, you need to tune SkyGlass so that um, you get a meaningful return in that sense. So let's pick a location. Uh, you, let's see, Mike was in KFRG. I think that was right. All right. And so I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to change my map zoom uh, up a little bit more. I'll wait for those tiles to render. All right. I'm gonna pick like a um, hundred miles and let's see, yeah, this is over New York, New Jersey, New Jersey area. So we're gonna have a lot of traffic. I'm gonna bring my height adjustment slider down in anticipation for the aircraft numbers here. And um, I'm gonna click on the top right-hand button uh, in the main button stack, which is a, a load button. And we'll see all these aircraft start to, to render in. Okay, so as this finishes, um, okay, great. So um, let's talk about types of aircraft. So now you'll notice now that we're not in mill mode, we've got different colored icons for the different types of traffic. And basically there are three different colors. We've got, um, let me zoom in one more time on the map, get a little bit more separation. All right, so basically there are three classes of aircraft. There are uh, military, anything that has been flagged as a military in the back end system. There are masked aircraft. And then there are anything that doesn't fall into those two categories, which are then a standard aircraft. So a standard aircraft are gonna be anything that is a commercial flight, uh, most private aircraft, the little Cessnas out you know, doing their flight training, um, personal aircraft, those are gonna be standard. A masked aircraft is, um, something a little special, um, most air traffic, or I'm sorry, most flight tracking apps um, get their data, uh, again, depending on the platform, from the FAA. And the FAA uh, has, a, has two different programs, um, which are kind of like pay to play to be removed from the public view. OK, and so um, it's not that they, you know, don't they don't have to have their transponder on or something like that. They're still part of the air traffic control system because they have to be if they're monitored or, you know, they require separation from ATC. But if they don't want to be part of the public facing feeds that go out from the FAA, they can subscribe into what's called um, the PIA or the LADD um, these two different programs that will basically filter them out before they're given out to the public for these other flight trackers. Um, ADSB Exchange doesn't have any arrangements with or get any of the data from the FAA, so they're not contractually obligated to filter their data. And that's why we can kind of see who's a masked aircraft and who isn't. So in Skyglass, we give them a special icon and a color, anything that's in magenta, um, uh, the sort of uh, you know purplish color, they are masked aircraft. And then the military, as you're familiar with, are the sort of yellow orange uh, with a, the orange uh, border around their background, okay? So you'll also notice when you stepped into standard mode, uh, out of military mode, not only did you get this uh, location chooser, but you also got this other pop-up here, which are these three different classifications, normies, standard aircraft, military aircraft, and the masked aircraft. Now, this last one, emergency, uh, any aircraft, whether regardless of what type, uh, what, what classification they are, they can be moved into an emergency state. They can declare an emergency. And then so we've built in the sky glass, uh, the ability to you know filter for just the uh, emergency uh, aircraft types. And so if an aircraft becomes, you know, declares an emergency and you happen to get them in a return, um, their aircraft profile color will remain the same, but the background will flash yellow and to call a little bit more attention to it. Uh, there'll also be a little pop-up window here 
Um, for those of us that were on as we were, you know, getting to know each other very beginning, uh, there was a military aircraft that declared an emergency, and that was showing in this little listing on the left here, a little pop-up panel. Okay, so um, very important. This is uh, to keep your to keep Skyglass responsive and working well. Uh, is to keep this search distance radius box. Um, to a point where you're only getting a good number of returns depending on your settings, okay? So let me say that again. So you'll tune your search distance radius based on the types of aircraft that you're getting back in the returns. If you're looking at an airport and you wanna see all different types of aircraft, regardless of what their, uh, you know, what classification they are, and meaning the, the normies and the military and the mast are all on, you're going to get everything. Um, you want to keep this low, okay? If you turn the normies off, you'll see my screen just reduced by you know seventy percent for the number of traffic. Okay, uh, I say all of this because most computers are going to start to get slow after about five, six hundred, depending on your computer hardware. Uh, at most about a thousand. Once you start trying to render more than you know six, seven hundred aircraft, Skyglass will become incredibly slow. So, meaning, you really, um, I there's very, 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 very few um, uh, hardware platforms that can do all aircraft or the United States all the time. Okay, including the normies, it's very easy to show. Um, let's see here, you know, several hundred miles. Um, let me zoom out, get over the states a little bit more, rehome. You can do several hundred miles if you're only looking at military or masked. All right, so let me do that. So we're somewhere over out of Kentucky, and I've got it out to about a thousand miles. And I'm going to load traffic. And you'll see, and you can see how quickly it starts to render in. Uh, and then once it gets up to about 500, it starts to slow down, uh, but it will finish. Um, but again, uh, if you've got an older machine, um, something that doesn't have a good graphics processor, this may be may be too much for the, the, the computer to handle. Okay, so you'll wanna do a couple of things. You can either reduce the search radius, turn off one of the classifications of aircraft, um, depending on what you're wanting, um, or just, you know, tune these things based on your, how responsive it's getting. So if Skyglass is getting very slow, uh, then you'll know that something is, you're asking a little bit too much of the, for the system. Um, incidentally, uh, you know, there's an expectation when you go onto like even the ADSB Exchange website, and you're like, oh, I can see all the aircraft of the States, right? Well, these icons are huge. And so they're, you know, clearly you're not going to have a, a you know, the aircraft is not the size of a city and something like that. It actually does a fair amount of filtering. You're not actually seeing everything, right? So Skyglass actually tries to put all the different aircraft and their position and a graphical representation in a 3D space. It can become pretty memory intensive, especially from a graphics processor perspective. So just want to kind of set your expectations. Uh, if you want to look at normal aircraft, you definitely want to keep the search radius down low. Okay, so let's do a little bit of tuning in that regard. So um, for uh, giggles here, I'm gonna put in a new, uh, let's go to DCA, uh, that's Reagan National. And I'm gonna reduce the search engine, rep um, I'm sorry, the search distance radius down hundred miles. I'm gonna turn, uh, before I turn on the uh, normies, I'm gonna go ahead and burn. This is this, uh, flame icon in this uh, auxiliary button stack. Basically, that's going to clear the screen, re clear all the traffic, gives you a little visual indicator when it's finished working. And then I'm going to reload traffic. Uh, now I'm going to turn on the uh, normal aircraft and then reduce my <clears throat> height adjustment slider to where I can see everybody that's sort of on screen here. So again, depending on your profile or you know what you're wanting to do with Skyglass, if you're wanting to look at a specific area, you want to home, put in uh, to the input panel uh, what your home location is. So let's do that again. K F R G. It's going to pop us over there, <clears throat> and then 
Uh, if you reload the traffic, you'll see that it's now loading in this uh, second area. So we didn't scrub. So we still have, now we've got two different sort of locations. You can see even that's going to start to slow sky, sky glass down a little bit because of the number of returns. If that happens for you, you can do a couple of different things. You can click on the stop button and that's going to basically arrest any refresh or any sort of automated cycle that's happening, anything that's starting to still load. You can just kind of stop it and then burn, which will clear the screen and then load traffic again by clicking on the top button. And you can see Skyglass is definitely way more responsive now. And then you can tune your UI so that you can see everybody that you want. Now, the first load always takes the longest. To reload or refresh will become very, very quick. So best to not turn it on to ref auto refresh mode um, until you know everything's loaded, and then you can kick off refresh, auto refresh, like I have now. And you can see here, I can make this even every five seconds, every even one second, and it will update very quickly. Okay. So uh, one thing I didn't cover um, in this top right hand corner, this um, the main load button. We've got two wheels. Uh, the yellow, as you can see, is the countdown timer for the auto refresh cycle. So let me bump that back up and you can see that'll <clears throat> start to tick down slower. The green inner one is a sort of a progress bar of the loading cycle. Um, when you're reloading and everything's you know, already been loaded at least once, it's doing an update. You won't even pretty you know, notice um, how quickly that turns around. But if I stop and clear and load again, <clears throat> <clears throat> you'll see that this green bar will actually wrap around and you get a sort of quick visual indicator of the progress in the load cycle. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So again, switching into mill mode, I'm sorry, into standard mode, uh, you'll want to may, you know, keep a couple things in mind. Uh, what are you trying to look at? If you're trying to look at all aircraft, including the standard, you'll want to keep that search radius low and homed into a specific location. If you're wanting to get um, just a look at the military aircraft over a specific area, you can turn off these other classifications like the normies and the masked. And now you have a you know, regional view of just that aircraft class, the, the, the military in this example. Uh, and then you can go much wider for your search radius because the number of aircraft that you're trying to you know, show on screen has been reduced. All right, does that make sense? Okay, looking good. All right, great. <clears throat> All right, let me go back and check my notes here, make sure I've covered everything. Um, uh, we do need to talk about the jumper, which I will. <clears throat> okay, so the the classifications here, um, this is kind of a way to, to filter and declutter uh, also in a sense. Um, and that is, you can turn manually turn on and off that uh, area by clicking on this little filter declutter button. Okay, the bottom part of this uh, will show um, what is on screen for all aircraft um, all the time. The only one that is on by default is the aircraft uh, profile icons. If I turn those off, now you can see it's only the aircraft sh aircraft chevrons that are rendered. Okay, click that back on. Now you've got the aircraft uh, icons, and then these are the different um, <clears throat> elements of that. So if you want to just look at the types, you can turn on the types for all the aircraft. Um, this part has the type and the transponder squat code. You can also turn on the call signs or the telemetry or all three. Um, and you can you know mix and match, do whatever you want. So here's just the telemetry. 
And again, this is, you know, depending on what you're trying to do and what your sort of knowledge level is, that kind of thing. I often like to keep the, um, uh, you know, when I'm in military mode or in this sort of hybrid mill mode, I like to keep on the types just because I can't represent, you know, I don't understand exactly what the profile is depending. Uh, so this is like kind of quick, you know, indicator of oh, these BE-20s, these are little transports, C-17s, these are movers, K-35Rs, these are going to be your uh, refuelers, things like that, um, versus trainers, helicopters. Okay. <clears throat> but if you want to look at the call signs, then you can kind of get that next level of, of uh, if you're a military aircraft watcher, you'll know that, you know, certain aircraft call signs have patterns, like this reach is going to be a, you know, mover, they're moving, hauling either people or equipment. Um, the K-35Rs sometimes will have uh, oiler, or some sort of a fueling kind of a reference. Uh, there's a lot of variations in that. Uh, <clears throat> good, we got a PAT, Priority Air Transport. So they're moving a VIP around. Uh, also, depending on the branch, uh, I think PAT, Ren, you, you can cross check me on this. One of them's Air Force, one of them's Army versus SAM versus PAT. Anyway, PAT is like, I think Air Force, a priority or transport. And if the army's moving them, it's a SAM flight, special air mission. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, somehow, you know, you can decode these these call signs. Um, I was speaking with somebody who was in the Air Force, told me that there is, and I referenced like, oh, there's so many acronyms in the, in the military. And he goes, yeah, somebody put out a reference manual and it's like 500 or 800 pages of just acronyms. So it's, it's an insane amount. Anyway, I think somewhere online, there is a you know, how to decode uh, call signs, military call signs. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is. Uh, it wasn't accurate enough for me to want to include it in the sky glass. I'll tell you that much. But uh, anyway, um, call signs, telemetry, aircraft class. You can toggle the on-screen for all of them in this little uh, panel there. And then <clears throat> if you want to have a, there's another little pop out at the bottom. You can look at air, uh, aircraft owner operator <clears throat> and that's this database icon here does a database lookup in mill mode it they, there are no owner operators it's all military uh, so there's actually nothing reported there um, <clears throat> but okay so um so i really want to drive home the the message because this is what you know if you don't understand this key point about standard mode and military mode when you're in standard mode you need to um you know, limit the number of returns either based on the search radius or the class before you load your traffic. Otherwise, you're going to have a sort of a poor Skyglass experience. <clears throat> Does that make sense? All right. Thomas, say hi to your cat for me. Cute little guy. Love cats. Okay. So um, moving up, we've got this next panel. Um, so let me let me flip back into military mode. That'll make more sense. And uh, I'm going to put in. Uh, you'll, so you'll notice a couple things happen. My my filter, my classification filter went away, and my home location uh, chooser also went away. By by default, I can bring that back by clicking there. And then let's see. I want to put in just USA. That'll get me sort of central CONUS, continental United States. And I'm going to zoom my map, zoom out so I can see the whole country. And then I'm going to turn my my location chooser off once that all catches up. There we go. All right. And then pop up my height adjustment slider. Okay. So now let's talk um, favorites panels. <clears throat> That's this next little grouping here. We've got the type uh, list panel, the watch list panel, and favorite locations list panel. So let me click on the favorite locations first. Um, favorite locations is, uh, by default, you've got two that are sort of preloaded. You've got CONUS, again, continent United States, and Europe. Um, <clears throat> and then you can add to them. So let me turn on the location chooser, and let me put in uh, KFRG. That's our favorite go-to for Mike today. Click on that. So once you have a, a home location loaded, then you can click on this favorite home locations plus sign in the header, and then it'll add that as a favorite. Very simple, okay? Uh, you can notice now I also have Miami in there and I've got you know, the two preloads. Um, so you can edit <clears throat> um, 
the entry, the label, by clicking on the little pencil icon. If you want to delete that item from your favorite locations, you click on the little X. That's going to remove it from the list. Um, very important note here. You've got a couple different things on the left-hand side. You've got a little target icon, and then you've got the word itself, the label itself. Um, so um, I want you to, to look at the, the green box. The green box, if you're if your home location panel is open, it shows you know where your home location is and the search radius around it. If you click on the word itself, the label, that will rehome to that area. All right, so I'll do that for CONUS now. It's going to pop over the middle of the United States. Okay, uh, let me put in uh, Miami again, home to that. I'm going to add that as a home, favorite location. Now I've got Miami in here. So again, if I click on the label, KFRG, it's going to move my home. And you'll notice that what happened on the screen, everything just kind of popped, right? If you click on the target, it's simply going to move the camera, okay? So if I click on Miami, you'll see now that everything kind of just zooms around, right? And it's actually a little bit faster. Depending on what you have loaded and what settings are, um, if you rehome, what SkyGlass does is actually it wipes the screen, changes the location, re-renders the map, and then re-renders all the aircraft. When you zoom, it just moves everything around. And if depending on what you have, how your settings are, it may be it may be much faster to zoom rather than to rehome. Okay, so that's the distinction there. Zooming is the target versus rehoming, which pops the area over. Okay, now if you're re uh, if you're going to zoom over to Europe. The map tiles are still probably going to need to render, but it won't have to repopulate and reposition all the different aircraft. So they can be a little faster experience for you. Okay. So personally, I like to use the zoom target, not the rehoming, but that's how you actually change the, if you want to change the home location, uh, like if you're in standard mode, then you'll want to click on the label itself. Okay. So let me get back over to Conus. Uh, all right. So that covers the functions of the favorite locations panel. Let me turn that off. Um, I found, sorry. Go ahead. I found that um, because I, I want Sydney as my base, uh, it, it's not staying there. It still defaults back to whenever I reopen it back to the US. Is, uh, yeah. Is, oh, is well, there, if, your, if your home location is set, uh, it should home back to your, the, it should uh, remember your home location. Okay. So you may be in military mode and you just may have moved over, but not changed your home. Um, but right. I'll, I'll confirm that um, and make sure that, uh, that it's not just popping up over the United States. I, I could be wrong, but it should, it should remember the home location. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. After reopen, yeah. All right. Okay, so let's play around a little bit with Australia now that we're here. So I've added Sydney, Australia as my favorite, uh, a favorite location. Um, we've got the East Coast here. Okay, so where was I? Um, okay, so uh, we did the favorite locations panel. Um, actually, let me go back over to Conus. I'm gonna rehome there. And let's talk, talk about the type list panel. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, sort of go into hybrid military mode. I'm going to be in standard mode. Then I'm, but I'm going to turn off the other classifications. So I'm just looking at military, but just over the United States. So we have military that are turned on, master off, standard is off. I'm going to go ahead and turn on auto refresh. And so now we've just got military over the United States area. <clears throat> okay, you'll also notice uh, as we switch modes from military mode into standard mode, the icon will change from a fighter to a sort of standard commercial aircraft. And the background also changes from this uh, in standard mode, you'll be in blue and military mode, you'll be in red. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, orange, sort of the standard military number. Okay, uh, color. So let me turn off the favorite locations and turn on the type list panel. Now the type list panel 
<clears throat> basically does a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it does a count and a listing of all the different uh, types that are reporting in the returns that you have. And the default is it's going to rank them in um, uh, by way of count, meaning uh, the most, you know, uh, the type with the most uh, number will be at the top and then it will go down to, to zero or one rather. Um, if you want to change this into alphabetical mode, <clears throat> that's this next icon here in the header. Click on that and it's going to shift it into alpha mode. So depending on what you're trying to do, you may want to keep it in alpha, alpha numeric uh, just so you can see, you know, and easily reference, oh, I know where the K35s are because I can just go find the Ks. Or if you're looking for Q4, obviously those drones are, you know, very few in number uh, that are up. So it's kind of hard to see the numbering uh, if it's not a very high number, uh, you know, in the count. Um, whereas if you want to like get a, a view of the uh, refuelers or trainers or, you know, like C-17s, those are going to filter up to the top pretty easily because they're, you know, high in number. Um, yeah, the refuelers. How do you do that? <laughs> So again, um, when you open the type list panel, it's going to default into the um, into count mode. And so you can see K35Rs are going to be towards the top of the count here with 16. If you go into alpha mode, then you'll just have to go alpha, you know, be uh, the alphabet and see, oh, there's the Ks, K35Rs. So let me switch it back to count mode. And <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so um, the type list panel, these are all buttons. And so if you click on one of the buttons, you'll isolate to that type. So let's do that with the refuelers, K35Rs, click on that entry and a couple of things will happen. One, the entry will be blue to show that it's isolated now for that type. And then you've got another panel that pops up, which shows a listing of all the actual aircraft and their call signs. Okay. Um, so here we have all the K35Rs, half of them are reporting NA for a call sign, then we've got some other BATs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to bring that down because it's not as important. Um, but you can also gang up these aircraft that you have in isolate mode, okay? So let's do the C-17s and the C-130s. And so now we've got kind of a lift, um, a visual representation of, you know, the heavy lifters and the refuelers. Uh, all in one go here. In the same way that you can be in isolate mode, you can uh, put something into hide mode. All right, so to reset the uh, all your selections, that's in the type list panel in the header. You've got these two arrows in a circle. Click there, and it's going to take away all the, the hides or isolations and reset the list. And then let's say uh, if you right click then or control click if you're on a non mouse system, uh, right click. That will turn red, and you'll see that those have been removed from view. So let's do those with the text twos and the T38s. And uh, any other lawn darts? No, that's everybody. Uh, sometimes the BE20s. Um, anyway, so now you've kind of refu removed all the major um, trainer aircraft, and you'll see those big groups have gone away in Texas and Louisiana. And now you've got sort of here's, you know, military operational kind of things over the United States. Um, okay. All right. So now let me reset those again. So it'll bring everybody back. And let's do this. Let me pick the C-17s and uh, talk about the other elements in this uh, listing panel here. So uh, you've got a couple more icons. Now we'll start to talk about traces. Um, traces are this bent line with an aircraft at the end of it. Um, if you click on that um, icon, it will start to render the trails or the traces of all those aircraft. And you'll notice a couple different things. Uh, since I turned the traces on in the type list panel, you'll notice in the main button stack, the traces icon is also activated. You'll also see this trace depth slider and panel here. Okay. And if we, let's make the trace depth to like six hours. It's going to reload all those traces. And we've got a little bit of a mistake here. Let me reload those again. There we go. Okay, so now you've got the traces for all those different aircraft 
um, but you've activated by class. All right, so let me turn those off for the C-17s. I'm gonna click on the uh, button again. It's gonna just take that out of isolate mode. I'm gonna click on the C K35Rs and click on their trace icon or trace button here and give that a second for it to load and you'll see start to see all the um, the traces start to load. Circle. What was that? Was that a question? That was so cool. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So um, there is a bug in this version. As you can see, uh, sometimes you'll see it from the from the origin, there'll be a straight line. That's just an anomaly a bug that I'm will be fixed in the next version. Uh, if you want to um, reload all the the traces you can click on the uh, trace depth again and it's going to clear them all reload them or you can change the trace depth uh, yes okay job um what you say drones come up as again uh the drones are uh, q4 q9 are the military drones the, q4, that's the type q9. yeah q4 okay. q, i'm not seeing any right now over the over the states um yeah, it doesn't seem any be any flying now. But, okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, so the the tri the um, K thirty fives R Rs are cool because you can see these marshaling patterns for the refuelers, like this guy here. You can see this little loop de loop that he's been doing over Arizona and this guy over the mid uh, sort of Midwest, etc. All right. So while we're looking at traces. Um, might be a good time to talk about the sort of parallax that you get from this height adjustment slider. Um, when you're kicked off to the side, it may be very difficult unless you, you know, really spent a lot of time in sky glass to go, oh, well, you know, I know that he's over a certain area. I like this guy's over Colorado. It's very hard from this perspective to know that he's over Colorado, okay? If you move your camera up to a top-down position, depending on where you are, you're still going to get a little bit of parallax because this is a 3D environment. So um, quick little tip here. If you want to know, you know where they are over the states or over a specific location and get just a very, um, without any parallax, you can kick it up to the top and then just bring this height adjustment slider all the way down. And that's going to flatten everybody. And so now there's no parallax or distortion based on the angle of your viewing. So now you can get a you know quick easy way to to know where everybody is. Um, and again, if you kick it off to the side, they're going to be basically you know stuck on the bottom of the map. So the your, your intuitive reference of where that is in space will be there. And then if you want to see the separation again, just pop it up, and now you can really get the detail in the aircraft traces and the flight levels. Okay, you'll notice also there are. Um, in the type list panel, there are these little button, uh, little swatches, and, and that represents the color code of the type of their trace, okay? So all the traces are type specific. Um, so let me bring in the uh, C-130, or let's see, C-30Js. Oops. No, it wasn't quite there yet. Let me paint there. And you'll notice that um, as these start to render, you'll notice there are different color scheme. And those are based on this color uh, reference here. If you click on the swatch itself, you've got a little color picker and you can change the color. So you can click anywhere in this color bar and the black circle will show uh, what that color choice is. Then you click on start and it's gonna change the start color and then click on, let's go to yellow, click end. And you'll see on screen, those have also been updated. So the, and the start is the oldest position. So like where it, where it took off from, if this is an old trace, the end ends at the butt of the aircraft. Okay, so the end uh, trace position is the most recent trace. It's the last known position. So the end, the trace ends at the aircraft, right? It's the most current location. Does that make sense? It's a little counterintuitive for some people. Um, okay, so start where it took off from, end at the last known position, at the end, of, ends at the end of the aircraft. Okay, and so again, the types um, are the 
different type and the, the colors are just sort of picked at random when you uh, first start up Skyglass, but you can tune these and change them based on, um, you know, whatever you'd like. And, you know, it also depends on kind of what your background color is for your map style, stuff like that. Um, these uh, bright colors can show up nicely depending on what area of the states you are for a satellite view. Um, I kind of like to keep mine in this uh, darker view because uh, then the traces really show up, um, pop very easily. All right. So um, that covers the basics of the type list panel. I'm going to close the type list panel. And in closing, it's going to reset all the isolates that I had. Okay. And it will keep, it will keep the traces. Um, if you want to clear all the traces, you click on the, you can just turn off traces and that'll unload them all. Um, if you want to turn the traces back on, if you click on an aircraft when these traces are on, a single aircraft, then it'll load that trace for that, just that aircraft. Okay. And you'll notice it's like, oh, I can't really see that, that trace where it ends, right? But I see the beginning. It's because the, um, the color is dark. So let's go find that aircraft. This is a C-17 and adjust that color spectrum. So it's found the C-17s, click on the swatch, pick a nice bright color, click the end, and now you can see that trace color has been updated. There's something more viewable based on the map style. If you have a light map, you'll want to change these colors to something dark, like the topo or the street map. Sometimes these can be hard to see, so then you can go and change these colors to something darker. Uh, you'll notice the top to bottom, there is actually a, um, um, you can get a, a whiter color or a darker color, but those traces will show up more easily. The traces also will thicken up if you change the scale and become very thin if you bring it the scale down. All right, makes sense. All right, so I'm bring this back to my view here and back to dark map. All right, how are we doing on time? Uh, it's about an hour and a half. Okay, good. Okay, all right, so let me turn the map styles off. And that's the basics of the type list panel. Now let's talk. Wanna, yes, sir. Did you want to mention uh, the select or isolate in iOS or the mobile version? Oh, good point. Okay, so um, since you don't have a right click, um, you, it simply cycles. Tap once to isolate, tap again to hide, tap one more time, and it resets it. Thank you, Brent. Okay, so now let's talk watch list. The watch list is this last uh, icon, the icon in the center, the banner. Again, the banner is your indicator for anything watch list related. Um, let me pull up the type list again. You'll notice when we had a type selected there, and it brings up the aircraft list, there's also some um, icons, the banner icons here. You can add them from the type list panel by clicking on their banner icon here. Uh, so let's do that now. Let's do copper. Uh, and you'll notice that the um, icon for the aircraft, uh, the background and the border changed. Okay, went to this sort of uh, more highlighted view. Um, let me turn the type list panel off. And uh, you can also right click on an aircraft or control click if you've got a non button, a non mouse setup. Right click will also automatically pop it onto the watch list. Okay. So let me go ahead and open up my watch list now. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to clear it just because this is kind of how you'll start with a, with a zero watch list. OK, so again, right click to add an aircraft to the watch list. You can also do it anywhere you see a banner icon. So I pick a, I've got another K35R in my HUD. I'm going to click that banner icon. And boom, we've, we've added it to the watch list. OK. So let me just pop through and just add a couple more random ones on here, just so I've got some to work with here and give you some basics. So you'll notice that in the watch list, um, everything gets first put into a unassigned group. Okay, watch list, you can put them into different groups um, and, um, and you can also edit um, 
their, their um, I'm sorry, what am I trying to say? Their label. Okay, so let's find that um, uh, bat and let's change his label and put him into its own group. So I'm gonna click on the, um, let me turn off auto refresh so we don't get other things happening. All right, so I'm gonna click on the edit button, which is this pencil over a piece of paper in the watch list entry itself for this bat 81. Okay. And the default, depending on how you've added it to the to the watch list, the label may um, be the hex code. All right. So let's just say this is a uh, Fueler one. Okay. And now we can assign it to a group. This will be a group of the um, uh, current groups that have been defined. And since we don't haven't defined any groups, it's just gonna be a very short list. So let me click on the plus sign. And then that's gonna change this interface and say fuelers and click on save. And now you'll see we've got a new group here with that aircraft has been moved into that group and then everybody else is still in the unassigned group. All right, so I'm gonna close this window by either clicking on the save button or the close button. And you can also now, since you've got a group defined, you can click on another aircraft, click its profile and um, drag it into that group or drag it out of that group. So I'm just gonna do that. Uh, okay. And now this doesn't obviously make any sense with this text two and the fueler, but you get the point. Um, so let me talk about uh, a couple other pieces here. Uh, you can see, um, in the in the aircraft entry itself, there's a few different fields. First one is its label. Next one is its last call sign. Uh, if it's flying now, its current call sign, and then the the uh, aircraft type. To remove it from the watch list, you can click on this banner minus sign button, and that's a two step process. There's a little bit of a like uh, an oh, oh no check. So if you click it once, it's going to move it into a deleted group, and then if you click it again then it'll actually kick it off the list and now it's gone forever unless you go find it again okay so let me just go put some more stuff on here put it back on the list okay uh so again deleting is a two-step first thing it's going to do is move it into a deleted group and then to actually delete it you can uh, click on it again or you can simply move it back into the list okay um the Aircraft, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, magnifying glass that kicks off secondary searches. You probably won't, don't want to do that. Uh, I got into that in the deep dive. Um, this next one is to edit, like we talked about. Uh, this next one is to show the trace of that aircraft. You can click on it here and show the trace uh, from the watch list panel. Um, and then to get some deeper information, you have to have the database loaded. Um, so you click on the information icon and it's going to say, oh, first you're going to load your database. So let's go ahead and do that. I usually don't get into this one, but it seems like we will now. So this takes a few seconds to load depending on the speed of your machine. This is the um, crowdsourced database from ADSB Exchange that they maintain daily. All right, so once that's loaded, click on the eye will give you this quick indicator, a uh, little, little readout of the different um, fields that are in the database. Um, Oh, one thing I didn't mention before, um, you'll notice that if, depending on what I'm hovering over, sometimes you get this little clipboard icon uh, that turns green. If I'm in, up in the HUD, you'll see the uh, the little border will show in green. Anytime that that happens in Skyglass, if you click on that element while it's highlighted in this way, it's going to take that information and put it on the clipboard. So this is a, a nice, easy way if you want to grab the hex code just hover, click. Now it's on your on your clipboard. You can move into a different application and paste from you know from Skyglass. Okay, all right. So a uh, little bit more about the watch list, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, the header itself uh, has a little count: um, how many aircraft are flying or active versus how many are. Um, in the list uh, total. So, uh, and right now in the watch list header, we've got only eight aircraft chosen um, right now. So, and they're all current uh, as they, you know, cycle out and are uh, not active, then this count will obviously be more meaningful. Um, most of you have probably grabbed the list from Monkey. So I'll talk about that real, real fast. 
Uh, Monkey Works puts out his watch list and that's available right now. That's available on his uh, website. You go to his store, you buy it. It's a free download. So you don't pay for anything for it. And then you get a link to download it. Once that is downloaded, you can import um, that uh, watch list from the watch list header. So open up your watch list, click on this little down, the folder with the down chevrons on it. And then you can, um, it'll first give you a little warning. Hey, do you want to replace the, your current list or add to it? You can replace. And then you'll go and navigate to where you've downloaded. And now you can pull in any watch list. In the same way, if you have an, a watch list that you want to share with someone, you can build up your watch list and then export it. And then you can be like Monkey and share your watch list. Once your watch list is on a machine, um, you can get it to your mobile device in this way. All right. So now we've got this big watch list loaded. Um, and there's a couple of icons, uh, cloud icons here. Once you have it on a device, you can push it up to the little sky glass cloud and you can have your watch list attached to your username and then open up your mobile device and open up your watch list and click on the um, cloud down and it'll bring that, that watch list down onto your device. Any uh, updates that you make as far as labels and things like that, you'll need to repeat that process because it doesn't, it isn't automatically shared or maintained. Okay, it's sort of a one button push and then pull. Okay. All right, so now we've got a bigger list. I can show some of the other details here. Um, in the same way that the type list panel, you can isolate and hide. Uh, same functionality here. Um, left click to isolate. Let me make that smaller. Uh, right click to hide and click again to reset it. So you can see we've got a few classifications that are hidden here by default from monkey, um, from monkey's list. Uh, you'll also notice um, there are little chevrons on the right hand side. You can collapse or expand the different groups. And then right now we have it in show everything mode. If you only want to see the aircraft that are flying listed, you can click on this, um, the aircraft icon in the watch list header, and that will filter and only show aircraft that are flying as listed. All right, the groups will still show, uh, but you'll also notice if the group doesn't have a um, any active aircraft, it'll be this muted orange. And if it does have an active aircraft, then it will be br the brighter orange. And then again, if you wanted to reset, it's the same icon, reset the hide isolate. That's in the header here. And there you go. So now we've got all those isolates off. You can also expand and contract all groups by clicking on the toggle here. We just collapse them and we can expand them all as well. All right. If you click on any entry in your watch list as the aircraft itself, it will move the camera to that location. Cool. All right. So let me collapse those. And let's see here. Looks like we only have only military up right now. I don't see any of the other aircraft types. Oh. That's because I had the uh, type uh, classification off. So let me turn those back on in the filter declutter and reset. In the watch list header, this first big gear icon is sort of a reload button. There we go. Okay, so that's an important note. I'm glad I did that. Um, if you have turned off a different classification, that will affect your watch list and will affect what's loaded and what's showing. So I turn those back on, and now you can see from Monkey's watch list, we've got some um, other aircraft besides military, a few masks, et cetera. Some of these are these, uh, uh, like City of Phoenix, that's going to be a, you know, a Leo Bird, 
law enforcement. Um, probably it could be a law enforcement, could be just a you know uh, contract by the city. Um, some of these are uh, the aircraft that do flight uh, surveying, um, take pictures of air, you know the um, terrain, etc. Now that I have the uh, database loaded up, you'll see we've got this extra um, owner-operator field in the pop-up panels. If I turn that on in my HUD, we will also see that listed there. Okay. All right, so will it list all types that are in the air? Um, yeah, if you've, if you've got the classification on, uh, you can also gang these up, meaning you can turn on the type list panel and do a C-17 isolate. And now you're showing on screen only the C-17s, right? But our load is only from the watch list, not from mill mode. So if you have your watch list, you know, open, it will only show, and you burned everything or reset, it'll only show those aircraft flying. Uh, you can also turn military mode on. And the watch list is also on. So now you're getting kind of a mix of all the different aircraft. We've got all the military plus the watch list aircraft and the type list will reflect everything that's loaded. Does that make sense? All right. Okay, so we did traces, we did iOS, uh, feed for Cam. Is Cam still with us? Uh, we're just gonna have to, we'll have to check the uh, replay. Okay, so if you are a feeder, I'll cover this real briefly. Uh, turn that off, turn the watch list off. Uh, if you go into the preference panel, it's very simple. If you feed to ADSB Exchange, all you need to do is click this feed from local network address, and the default should work if you've set it up correctly and it's uh, on a sort of a standard network. So I'm going to click burn, and you'll notice a couple things here. Uh, first, the aircraft um, background changed to this magenta. That means you're in in private feeder mode, and I'm going to load traffic, and we'll see data from my feeder. If all goes well, there we go. Good. <laughs> yeah. So this is my antenna on my on my roof is getting these aircraft right now. The uh, only limitation is um, you probably may you may have um, limited uh, aircraft detail if you don't have the database open. It won't have the type aircraft. Um, that's a back end lookup. Um, but since I do have it open, we get a lot of information here. Boy, that's a big owner operator. Peloton Holdings LLC, Bag Aviation LLC, Metro Larry, all the people. Whew, that's a mouthful. All right, longest one I've ever seen. All right, good. So to switch you back into your standard source, turn on the preferences, click on ADSB Exchange Internet Feed. That's what you want to keep it on if you want the uh, air traffic that are not on just your feeder. And then click close. Uh, you can also, so from the local address means you're on the same local subnet of your feeder. If you want to monitor it from afar, you need the anywhere ID or user ID is now, but it's been renamed if you've updated your feeder. Uh, then you just pop that in this and then you can see it regardless of your location as long as it's up. So you can kind of monitor your feed from afar. All right, now I'll burn again and I'll load. I'll go switch into, back into military mode. All right. Okay, I think we've covered everything. Is there a way to look at past history or is it only live? Absolutely. So there, this is a, I will refer you to the deep dive. There's two um, ways to do that. Well, it'll be the same deep dive, uh, time travel mode and flight history reporting. Okay, that's where you wanna go. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. If you if you drop into time travel mode, I'll just cover it super brief here. That's an advanced to, uh, topic. Click on this little uh, icon here, the advanced options. This first one is time travel mode. The second one is um, 
flight history reporting. This next one is uh, to change your feeds without being in the preferences, and then you can change your color options. Click on time travel mode, and it'll tell you, oh, we're going to need to switch modes here. And now basically you're in standard mode, so you need a home location and a search radius, and then you pick a time. And you can go back. Uh, let me check my dates here. Um, Skyglad, the data is good from March of 2020 forward. And it's every five seconds. So basically you dial in a location, dial in a time in UTC. This panel, pick your panel is in UTC. It does give you a home um, location adjustment, uh, but you should dial in your location. And then you can either play back or forward in speed or, or load a snapshot. But just remember when you're in time travel mode, you're in standard mode. You're, you're, there's no such thing as military only mode in time travel mode. So this is kind of your way back machine. Um, and you can go, like I said, back a couple, three, three plus years. All right. And then to get out of time travel mode, click on the close button or the icon. And now you're back in live mode. The other way to do um, reporting and that sort of you know historical view is to run a flight history report. Uh, and you can do that per aircraft or per watch list group. Uh, and that is anywhere that you see the hourglass is you can run it by, by an aircraft by clicking in the HUD hourglass or by a group um, hourglass. And that will pop up a, it's gonna ask you to burn again and then pop up this new picker panel, which preloads all the hex codes in the input box. And then you basically dial in how many number of days based on this starting time looking back, right? So if you want to do 30 days from now, it's set up for you. If you want to change the number of days or, you know, if you want to go back and go out, oh, you know, January of 2021, you dial it in here and then 10 days back from that starting point looking backwards. Did that answer your question? Oh, thank you, Red. You dropped the link in the chat. Go ahead, okay. Uh, yes. How do I get that um, monkey monkey list? Yeah. So you just go out to his web website, monkeyworksus.com, I think it is. Okay. Um, and then go into the store and just search Skyglass and you'll see it. Okay, thanks. You just add it to your card. You know, and, and purchase it for free. Um, and so I will tell you in the next version of Skyglass, which I'm working on, uh, I'm going to give you guys a preview. You want a preview? Okay. All right. Yeah. Preview. Preview. Woohoo. All right. So let me <laughs> Skyglass. I, I tell you, I've been working on this thing for months, not for months, but for many months. And um, holy smokes, it is a bear. Anyway, what I was going to get to was, um, in the next version of Skyglass, you'll be able to share your watch list publicly within the Skyglass ecosystem. And so you'll be able to see who's got their sky, their watch list published. You know, will be a little up, to, up and uh, down vote kind of thing. Probably just not vote like I like that Skyglass. But anyway, so it'll be much faster and easier. Monkey will just be able to share his watch list with one button here. And then you can just go see the list, see his, download it directly. So anyway, so yeah, we've got a 3D... Um, globe now uh, let me pop into military mode and we'll load some traffic so that's the first big thing is we've got uh, two different map modes um, the other fun fun thing that i'm working on i'm testing right now so let me turn on my uh, special uh, stuff here um, so okay do you mind so somebody's got me um muted no okay there we go okay i was getting some feedback okay so um there are some different levels of weather so i'm, I'm still getting the feedback somebody have me unmuted no that's weird okay maybe it's me i bet it is but i don't have that doesn't matter okay so um we've got some radar options now for weather so this is one level of weather, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and then there's some different you know, types of weather. Uh, this is the satellite and radar composite, or you can just look at the radar mosaic. That's cool. 
super fun. And now this is my favorite part. I haven't done this yet for the round map, but I do have it on the flat map. All right, so let me zoom out, get the flat map. Oops, where are we are? There we go. Flat map is loaded. So um, y'all are familiar with TFRs, I'm sure, temporary flight restrictions. Now we have 3D TFRs. And if you're a pilot, Mike, you'll know this. There, um, I'm also dialed in, and I think this is the first time, in fact, you guys are seeing this, this is the first time ever showing this wide. I've shared a few screen grabs to some of my beta testers, but that's it. Um, Sigmets and airmets. So these are a special type of notum. Sigmets are um, significant weather notifications for pilots that will affect all aircraft types. Airmets are, um, will affect some aircraft types. So now we have, and I, and I think this is the first time anyone has ever done this, 3D airmet Sigmets in 3D space. Check that out. How fun is that? Yeah, very cool, very cool. So now you can hover and say, oh, like that's a TFR, special security TFR. Like let's, what's this guy? This is a SIGMET for convection. Here's a SIGMET for uh, also convection. I think this is an AirMET for convection. Let's see here. SIGMETs, SIGMETs. It's like, so this one uh, typical over the coastal areas, you'll get some uh, visibility AirMETs for IFR, et cetera. But I think this is so fun, and I've never seen this anywhere. And again, these will squish and stretch with your um, with the height adjustment slider. But uh, yeah, super fun to see this like massive TFR for the space launch over uh, Nevada. That's crazy. It's like zero to hundred thousand feet, <laughs> so it's like goes up into infinity. So we got some cool weather stuff happening. Still a lot more work to do. Uh, this will be a premium, sorry, but will be a premium level stuff. Uh, this weather API is so not cheap, um, but I'm really hoping that I'm gonna have enough users that are gonna be interested in this that'll pay for the premium so that I can actually keep this going. Uh, it's a bit of a gamble for me. So let me let me ask you guys this. What what do you think, uh, the, the, worth it for a premium level for to do cool weather stuff like this? Oh sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, how premium? Are. How premium? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and there, there is also this other piece that I have. Um, uh, like uh, you'll notice, I've got a vo little volcano, volcanic ash. These will come up as the notice, but I also have like what air, um, what volcanoes were erupting or have current events happening, and then you've got the uh, ash alerts, and then there's also this sort of storm tracker. Um, it's not quite tuned yet. Um, and I'll, I'll just let this start to render as we go here. Um, you can see them start to paint in. There's just so many of them. I've got to figure out a, a way to meaningfully declutter because um, it just it's, it's, it gets too busy. But um, you can see them all sort of painting in these sort of vertical sort of storm cell, what their height is, and then a vector and a direction speed. But uh, you can see they're all in these special air mat areas, SIGMET areas as well. But uh, and then you get some detail. Anyway, I will leave it there. You get the first preview of these uh, special new weather features that are coming. I'm glad, thanks for the feedback. Uh, it's been months and months of me working at this um, and uh, changing over to this globe map system. It's super cool, but man, it's, a, it's, a, it's like rebuilding Skyglass from the ground up almost because it starts with the map, you know? Um, a lot of it, some of it I've been able to port, but uh, anyway, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of learning. Um, a lot of late nights, <laughs> a lot of long days. Anyway, mm -hmm. good stuff. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other last questions before I leave you? Uh, feel free to uh, leave any comments in the chat, any feedback for your experience today. Um, I get to read these afterwards. And uh, so if you want to just give me some feedback on how it went. Um, and let me also just sort of plug some merch and some other ways to, to give to Skyglass. Um, as I did mention, when I roll out the next version, this will be version 2.0, Skyrider Bravo. Um, uh, there will be a premium level that will have some extra features and some cool stuff. Um, I will be putting out an update for the iOS version, cleaning up that interface, making that a lot more useful. Um, 
There's also, let me turn off the, the sharing here. There we go. Uh, also got some cool merch and wearing, wearing one of the t-shirts. We've got a couple of glasses out there. Thank you, Ren. Uh, I think Thomas is one of those uh, mugs as well. Um, any, all, all this kind of stuff really helps, you know, support what I got going on. There's also a Patreon community. If you want to join Patreon and just give me a little bit extra every month or every year, whatever your commitment is. If you do think, um, you know, what I do is, is uh, worthwhile, you can support me there. Um, I am an army of one. I do all of it myself. I conceived of it and programmed it in one website and all the servers and all that kind of craziness. Um, it, you know, I will put a big shout out to ADSB Exchange. Uh, they have built an amazing network of like 9,000 feeders across the planet and they feed all this and that's, you know, crowdsourced effort. Um, and I just love those guys. So uh, anyway, um, feel free to reach out uh, anytime if you need any help to the need help button on my website, um, or you can use the uh, support form. And I uh, really appreciate everybody being here today. Um, <clears throat> any final questions or thoughts before I let you go? Really appreciate everybody being here today. Thank you so much. No, I learned a lot. Thank you. You bet. Glad you're here. Good stuff. Hey, Mike, uh, I will ask you this. Will you mind pinging me on my website? I'd love to have an offline conversation with you about uh, what you had going on and if you can use Skyglass in any specific way. I'd love your feedback. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, yeah, I could. Yeah, absolutely. We can do an offline. Good, good. good. And I tell you, anytime, anytime, I, this is the, I'll leave you with this. Anytime any of you ever find yourself saying to yourself, I wish Skyglass would do X or Z, Y or Z please reach out and let me know. There has been so much that I have built out just because somebody suggested something, gave me a great idea. Um, you know, just watching Monkey do his thing, I've added a lot of fun, you know, cool features. So uh, you guys really do drive the development and the direction. Uh, and I really take your feedback seriously and it really does make an impact. So please feel free to reach out with suggestions, comments, feedback anytime. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. All right. So God bless out. Stay frosty. <laughs> Cheers, everybody.